I'm happy to start this webinar on longevity. I think the subject is very interesting and I've worked very much on and very long on putting up a longevity model for um, physicians so that they have all the information they ever dreamed of um, on how to live longer with hormones and other um, treatments. And there's a translation in uh, Spanish, just click on interpretation in Spanish. There's translation in French, just click on uh, Le Francais. And then there's a translation in Ukrainian, but you have to click on Russian to get this interpretation. I'm very happy to announce that we have a more of the 100 Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian doctors that are participating in this uh, webinar as attendees. Um, so let's go and start. Normal longevity is you get as a child, you grow up as an adult, you get a middle-aged adult, and then slowly you, you start um, aging and you die. This is not really what we really want. What we really want is actually to extend the longevity, to put some more time when you remain as a young adult or as a middle-aged adult longer healthy. And so to add some additional years of life and especially of quality of life where you are still in good condition. And that is the topic actually of this webinar. Um, so some people say, oh, I want to wait till I have all the studies. But if you wait till you have all the studies, that's too long. That's just too long. And it's probably too late. Uh, we have already enough and more than enough uh, data saying that you can do a lot to live longer and that it's just now two or three years that you probably can live 20 years longer, longer and uh, in a more youthful state. So let's see what this model that I have done has as information and we're going to pick up some of the information in this webinar that will intrigue you and also teach you uh, probably new things. So longevity factors, um, there's a whole session of two hours on longevity factors, on everything, also the emotions and on ph pharmaceutical drugs to live longer. There are several of those that have shown to have efficacy. Then there's a whole uh, more than two hour webinars on diets, foods and drinks to live longer. And then what is fascinating is a centenarian uh, session on everything that makes uh, centenarians live longer and especially there's a whole session on positive psychological attitudes that you will like a lot. And then there are a session on centenarian hormone and nutritional levels because centenarians have higher hormone levels and on many of the main hormones. Did you know that? And there's also the hormone therapies to live longer. What are the studies that show it? What is the doses that can help? And what in emergency situation, how hormone therapies can save your life? And, and what are doses to give? Also melatonin, DHA, cortisol, aldosterone, uh, and then sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone in men and women. There's a lot of information out there and I've collected all that information. Um, so let's look at what in session one we can learn. Uh, there are these longevity factors that make us live longer. What are they? Well, in this session, we're going to first see a part where what are the good body parameters? What's the right glucose level, CRP to live longer, cholesterol, homocysteine, or what are the physical markers of energy? What is the good blood pressure, the weight, the muscles, the fat mass? And then there's a part in this session where um, every all the studies are overlooked on optimizing education, lifestyle, how to remain active, what it does, how much it affects longevity, meditation, also religious attendance, spirituality, uh, health practices, projects for the future. Um, there's a lot of information I can tell you. It fascinated me to work on this um, we webinar and on the whole model. And then there's also experiencing positive emotions. If you feel well, you live longer. If you have hope, you live longer. If you're happy, you live longer. Wouldn't that be a good sense of humor also? We're going to see a study here. And then avoiding stress and negative emotions and how to avoid distress, avoid withholding emotions. We'll see 
uh, some of this information here, but most of the information is in the occasional model. So let's look at the, some of the blood parameters. What is the right glucose level where the levels of um, mortality are the lowest? Where you have the most chances of living, living longer. And you see here, there's um, in a mean follow-up of nine to 12 years, there's uh, the, the best glucose level between 80 and 94 milligrams. And if it's lower, if it's like 75, 70, did you know that you double the cardiovascular mortality and you increase the all-cause mortality? And if it goes to 60, you have about triple more mortality. So really, you need to stick to these levels, neither too high, neither too low. And when we look at the COVID-19 patients, one of the reasons that some of them die is that they are have actually higher glucose levels. Each third out, each 33% of increase of fasting serum glucose, of the blood glucose level, gives more than triples the mortality. So if you're in the highest third aisle, you have about six times or seven times more mortality than a person who is in the lower uh, third aisle. So if you have COVID, don't get high sugar levels or decrease them. Let's look at how activities can fasten. And I have a lot of studies that have overgone about the activity. So I'm just going to point to one study. These are physically active men uh, that are relatively healthy and they're follow-up for 15 to 16 years. And those who are physically active compared to those who are inactive or occasionally active, they actually have a, almost a double of survival time, especially if they have moderate physical activity. Light physical activity gives a slight difference. Vigorous physical activity doesn't give so good results as moderate physical activity. So you need to moderate your physical activity, but have it enough and especially regularly enough to live longer. And there are many studies that are even more dramatic when you do jogging, et cetera, but you need to jog at a pleasant place not at um, uh, a pace that is um, uh, too quick. If you do competition, it often uh, neutralizes the good effect. So let's look here at some of the health practices that you could do. And why not look at cancer patients, cancer patients who are going to die. At least that's the diagnosis that the doctor is going to give. How do these, these patients make that the doctor is misdiagnosing them or, or, or their prognosis? Well, here's 22 patients with metastatic, metastatic cancers. And nine are highly evolved in self-help strategies. They do relaxation, they visualize their uh, improving, they're meditating, uh, they're writing a journal, and they're trying to really do good for their um, mental status. And then they are compared to eight who do not do anything. They surrender. They don't want to live longer, or they don't think they can live longer. Well, what is the difference in mortality after one year in these? This is those who are poorly or no involved, only 12.5% survive the one year or the two years, two years. And those who are patients with highly involved self-help strategy, almost none of them die. 89% are still surviving, seven times more. That's the difference between involving in self-help strategies and um, having um, given up, surrender, that you think you cannot do anything. Projects for the future, that may also increase longevity. Look here, you have a um, study on French old adults that are aged 60 years or over. And those who had a project for the future, who had plans, things to do, believe that they have a future, well, basically they more than doubled their survival. And that's about four or five years of longer life. Uh, it may be up to 10 years longer life. That is the difference. What about meditation? Can meditation help somewhere? Yes, it does. It helps to survive longer. But look on some of the details. You see here, 
Uh, for example, um, uh, in a study of 73 older, 73 older adults, they are an average age of 81 years, so they have high probability of dying. And um, the survival after three years for those who don't follow meditation or any problem doesn't is relatively um, uh, modest. 70% of them survive. Relaxation, same. Um, it doesn't make a difference to do relaxing exercise to live longer. But if you have mindfulness training, you know, being conscious of where you are, the moment of now, uh, many of them survive. But if they went on a higher level, they went to transcendences, really transcendental meditation, where you feel that you're not only in the moment of now, but you feel the past, the future, like a moment in fraternity, that transcendence, that makes a difference. 100% of the 81-year-olds were still alive three years after. So you can do it. And what does a transcendental meditation does? Really a meditation where you feel this tingling feelings in your body, you feel contact with the world. I can tell it is easy to feel, but you need to be in the moment of now or this moment of eternity. What does it do on carotid atherosclerosis? Look, if you do during less than one year, six months to nine months, you do transcendental meditation. If you just do health education, you continue on worsening with time, your atherosclerosis. But if you do transcendental meditation, you decrease that their sclerosis. So not only do you slow down the progress, no, you reverse it. And this is just after six to nine months time. So if you do it three years, four years, probably even better. So go on into transcendental meditation. Just to remind you, for those who are have just clicked now, there's a Ukrainian translation that you find here on clicking on the Russian uh, part uh, of interpretation and pour les Français, il est en français, en espagnol, clique uh, uh, interpretation espagnol. Now let's go on the longevity uh, by positive emotions. Be optimistic. It helps also to live longer. And there's a lot of studies. Uh, I, I think I have uh, like 14, 15 studies that I found that show you that being unoptimistic makes you live longer. Here's one of them. This is um, a study on about almost 1,000 older Dutch adults aged between 65 and 85 years. And um, old adults with high levels of optimism in the upper quartile during a nine-year follow-up compared to those who are in the less lowest 25% of optimism, if you really have high optimism, you're in the 25% highest levels. What you have is then almost two times less overall mortality and 77% and less risk of dying from heart disease. Imagine what a difference. It's good for your heart and it's good to live longer. So be an optimistic. You cannot be an optimistic and a pessimist. You cannot be an objective person. So why not choose to be an optimist and you'll live longer? And humor. Humor is really, really is something that can make a difference. It's not just one study. This whole set of studies shows you. So adults who are score above the median uh, in sense of humor, so about the 50% highest uh, uh, levels of humor have more um, uh, subject to well feel better actually and actually they also have doubled their survival chances so it, it really helps to live longer to have humor but what type of humor enjoying humor is important and if you are yourself a clone that's different that doesn't really help you to survive longer when you look at clones, for example, like here, individuals who are really in the business, they are professionals of, uh, and like clones are entertaining people, they are stressed by their entertainment. And basically they usually die at an earlier age. If you compare them to writers who are writing at home, those who are um, professional clones or entertainment humor humoristic persons, they, they die earlier. 
So actually um, inventing and providing humor may decrease the lifespan because of the stress that it gives. So it, you find, um, it, you need always to find new material. So try to enjoy humor. Try to see life as a humoristic situation. Don't think that um, important things in life are serious things. Important serious things in life also have humor. There's a humoristic side you can see, a comic side, and why not laugh easy? That brings joy to not only you, but to other people. Now let's look at what happens with negative emotions. Avoiding or expressing negative emotions is probably what you need to do. Let's look here at 51 Catholic clergy members that average age 75. And what was found in these people uh, is that those who expressed their anger and the uh, uh, like, like you see here on the picture, actually during a follow-up of almost five years had no increase in mortality. Uh, some studies do show that when you are hostile, there's an increase in mortality. This study doesn't because it made a difference between externalized uh, negative effect and withholding emotions. So what happens when you internalize negative? You don't express it like this man. He gets that more depressive and he suppresses his anger nearly two times more mortality so it's suppressing emotions that are good now how come how do you should you do if you really want to be yourself and i think that you have a spiritual um, involvement in your life there's a, a reason why you're here is to be yourself and to shine so that people feel better when you are there because you are yourself you don't need to be another person. And that means that all emotions that come in you, also negative emotions, need to be accepted in you and expressed. Whatever the reason, there should not be a reason for an emotion. Once you have, you accept, you express it in yourself. You won't internalize because it's going to be expressed and it goes away and it transforms you. It makes you a better person. And then you will probably live longer and not shorter, like in, in this study shows. There's also a whole session of pharmaceutical drugs that can help us to live longer. And what type of pharmaceutical drugs can expand the healthy lifespan? Well, there's a lot of them. There's what is called xenotherapeutics. And in the model, I'll be much talk more deep on it. There are also calorie restriction mimetic drugs, drugs that mimic low calorie diets and uh, um, intermittent fasting. And like rapamycin and um, metformin. And then there are telomerase activators that are, make a difference, like astragalus extracts, for example, or epitalum. And there are also anti Parkinson drugs like Diphranil that make a difference. They make Parkinson patients live longer. And then there's aspirin and other blood thinners, and also gene modifying drugs. And drug combination, so this session is really interesting because it's giving cutting edge information. And let's look at telomerase activators that they extend the healthy lifespan. And I've just made here an exception. I'm going to show you what happens when you give selenium and coenzyme Q10. This is a Danish study that have been done during 42 months on older adults from Sweden, age 70 to 80 years. And uh, they used selenium 200 micrograms per day and 100 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 during 42 months. And actually what happened is that compared to placebo after 42 months of trial, it significantly decreased the telomere length shortening. So with age, we shorten our telomeres, the ending of our chromosomes. And that makes that cells cannot divide so well anymore, that, that the cells age. And so it prevents or decreases the uh, senescence of the cells. And those who die actually have a 12%, 16% shorter leukocyte telomere length. So a small difference can make a big difference than survivors. And, and this is valid for cardiovascular mortality and overall mortality. So basically don't get shorter leukocyte telomere length. And I believe at that instant, 
in, in, in this, this study actually, or a similar study with the same dose of selenium and coenzyme 10, that the mortality decreased, I think, by 45%. Um, not sure about the exact figures, but it was impre it is impressive. And what you see here is that um, the leukocyte telomere length actually did not decrease during the 42 months, slightly increased in those who were taking selenium 200 micrograms per day, coenzyme Q10, 100 milligrams a day. You can really relengthen this short telomere. So you can reverse aging actually with telomere activator, including selenium and coenzyme Q10. While placebo, you've seen 42 months there was a decrease in leukocyte telomere length. So you have, you don't need a prescription for selenium and coenzyme Q10, go and go take that. If you add on that astragalus extract, epitalon and others, you will probably have a relengthening of your telomeres because you activate the telomerase enzyme that does that. Let's look a little further about what should you eat to, to live longer. And basically in this, uh, there's a first session where I talk about healthy diets, the paleolithic type diet, how it does, what it does on longevity, the low calorie diet, the intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, and also diets from our, um, from longevity areas like Okinawa and other um, country uh, areas. And then you have the unhealthy diets like the westernized diet, the, uh, high fat diet, the carb rich diets, et cetera. And we'll look into details and, and, and understand better what is the best diet for your patient. Now let's just take a look on vegetarian diets, what they do on longevity. Well, this bigger study on more than 73,000 adults, men and women, vegetarians actually in the, among those had actually a 14% improvement of overall survival. But you would say, I know several vegetarians and they all have different types of vegetarian uh, diets. Yes, okay, let's look into what is the difference on longevity. Here, for example, if you have a milk and egg eating diet, you increase the survival but 10% only because including milk products is not the best thing. This is over about six years of meat and follow-up. And then a fish eating diet, actually, that's what you should do. If you have a vegetarian diet and you, you should include animal proteins, and that's the fish, 23% longer overall survival. And then the semi-vegetarians, those who are sometimes vegetarians than omnivores, actually only have a 9% overall survival. So basically stick on a fish eating vegetarian diet and it's quite good. However, studies have shown that if one who eats meat eats health conscious, doesn't cook on high temperature, his food takes a lot of fruit and vegetables, he has an equivalent improvement in his survival, in his longevity. Now, I have also a session that specifically centers on each type of food, fats, proteins, uh, sugar, sweet or carbs, and, 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 and then toxic food and things like that, that is really interesting. So basically what we have in this session is we'll talk about drinking fluids, how it can improve your longevity. That healthy foods, which are the healthy foods? Mushrooms, fish, unprocessed meat, poultry, low cholesterol. Um, avoid fluids other than um, drinks like coffee, than water, coffee, alcohol, milk, Fruit juice is not good. We'll show you a study so you, you, you can see that. And then avoid unhealthy foods, sugar, sweets, dairy products, processed meat, high temperature cooked foods, and things like that. So we'll see that all in details, always with studies, simple to understand, but you know in what measure it helps. Is it 20% less, 50% less, 70%? In general, it's about 20, 25% less when you take a food item separately. So let's look at fruit and vegetables and one of the numerous studies. If you have one serving a day, for example, like an apple or uh, some vegetables, a serving of vegetables during a follow-up that can go up to 26 years of um, follow-up diseases and meta-analysis of 16 prospective court studies. So really, really real science here. There's a 5% survival per serving 
So if you have five servings, it can be a 25% improvement. And vegetables, vegetables, five per, one, one serving of vegetables, 5% higher survival. And fruit, 6% higher survival if just it's one piece of fruit. So if you separate them, it makes almost no difference. You eat a fruit serving or a vegetable serving. And so how much servings can you eat to improve your longevity? Well, a maximum of five servings to make a difference. Above that, it doesn't make a difference if you eat seven servings or five servings of fruit and vegetables a day. So interesting, and there are many studies. This is really a basic of longevity. Eat fruit and vegetables, fresh fruit and vegetables, because preserved fruit vegetables are not good. Uh, and, and, and frozen fruits are, uh, preserved fruits are not good neither. It has to be fresh. Remember that also. What about eating whole meat? Unprocessed meat. Well, it's usually good in most of the studies, at least in this study, higher intake of unprocessed meat in patients who had prostate cancer uh, and significant increased overall survival. And this is from a medium one year to 24 years of follow-up in this group of more than 9,000 men with non-metastatic prostate cancer. So the more you eat, they eat meat, unprocessed meat, the better their survival was. You should also avoid fruit juices. Fruits are good, whole fruits, because when you eat them, the sugar goes slowly in your blood and that's okay. But a fruit juice is concentrated sugar. And that's not so good. For example, daily consumption of 250 grams or more a day of total fruit juice, so a quarter of a liter, after eight years of follow-up, has significant 23% decrease of overall survival. And, and it's even more for heart disease survive. You have easier heart uh, mortality, mortality by heart disease, 32% more mortality of 32% less survival. And there are several studies showing that, so it's not the only study. And another study here on, on uh, about more than 20,000 adults showed that um, when they were drinking five glasses of more fluids other than water, like coffee, alcohol, tea, uh, well, basically compared to less than two glasses a day uh, or equal to two glasses a day per day, what you had is that it in more than doubled the coronary heart disease risk in women. And, and more than 50% coronary heart disease risk increase in men. So it's not good for the heart to drink other things than water. There are studies showing the soup okay if it's not full of salt. So um, be careful. You may also take herbal tea, but do not take caffeinated coffee or caffeinated tea or cola or soft drinks, etc. They are not so good. Then what about centenarians? You want some information? Okay. In this session, the session three, we have everything that makes centenarians live longer, except the psychological attitudes are detailed here. So centenarians and septenarians will know facts and numbers about what a septenarian is, who is the number one supercentenarian in the world for the moment, the oldest person, genetics, uh, what makes the, the telomeres are longer after centenarians, and then they're also more social, they have more social activity, have better function, they keep on being busy, actually, uh, more than 80-year-olds, uh, for example. They all often have also better diet, and even their microbiota, is better at least, healthier, is richer, more diversity. And they don't eat fried foods, for example. And they have also mental features are better. They are better in their minds, centenarians. So we're going into all these details. I'm going quickly over, but there's so much valuable information about them. Then the positive psychological features. If I have probably one lecture that is better than others, is this one, the positive attitudes of centenarians. It's my favorite lecture because you learn so much. I have a great admiration for these positive and active centenarians. And then better sleep. They have a better sleep in general. 
and they have better physical uh, features. They have a very low comorbidity up to age 90. None of them generally has a disease. And they are rarely have cancer. The, in one study showed that centenarians have a 0.4% risk of cancer. Imagine. And look at Lucille Randon. Today, this, she's a nun, a sister. She's born in 1904. And she started a super centenarian, is 118 years old, 277 days today. And she's been a nun for over 75 years. And um, she's currently actually the fourth person ever to be recorded to be so old. Imagine, she's almost 119 years. She's also the second oldest European person ever after number one French, Jeanne Calment, 122 years. And the fourth oldest person ever recorded and, and she even survived the COVID-19, imagine. Two years ago, she had the COVID-19. She was infected and she survived it in the hospital. What strong she is. And we have data on mortality in COVID. What makes people different? And actually, super centenarians who have known the period of the Spanish flu and over survived the Spanish flu are more stronger. They survived the COVID-19 thanks to their stronger immunity. Now let's look at the mental characteristics of centenarians. And one of them, these are Portuguese centenarians, more than 1,500 of them. And they were um, examined and about more than 80% are relatively good memory. 39% had no difficulties for memory and concentration and 42% just mild difficulties. So more than 80% of them had still good mental status. But other uh, characteristics like the physical constraints, seeing, hearing was not so good, and their mobility was particularly not good. 84% uh, could not really climb easy walking or, or climb stairs. They also could have, uh, for dressing, some problems, 81%. So the mind is the thing that helps them probably live longest. And centenarians also are less inflamed. You have here 86 centenarians compared to middle-aged healthy adults. Middle-aged healthy adults younger than me. And they usually have lower, the lower the inflammation is in them, the CRP below 10 milligrams per liter, interleukin six, uh, less than six picograms per ml, endothelin one, et cetera. So all these parameters of inflammation and, and blood coagulation are actually better in them. And so the lower the inflammation is in these centenarians and also middle-aged adults, the better their survival is. So if you have an older person who's inflamed, try to reach it. There's so many things that can be uh, improved also naturally. And the first thing is a low calorie diet. If you could put a person who's inflamed on low calorie diet, you can have 83% decrease in the CRP. That's enormous, enormous decrease in inflammation. First thing when a person is inflamed, eat less. And don't eat inflammatory foods. Eat, eat boiled vegetables and, 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 and meat, for example. That's perfect to decrease inflammation. Now, what about diets from regions with many centenarians? I don't have the time to talk here about, but I can tell you that Okinawa is an island on southern of Japan that was a lot of centenarians who will investigate the, the, the diet there, but also you have the Hunzakuts in North Pakistan, you have the um, Apsakis in Apsakia, who are in, in Georgia, and then you have also a region in Ecuador, in the Valacamba, that is screened, and, and actually the common, what they have is a low calorie diet. Now let's look at some of those positive psychological attitudes of centenarians. When you look at those centenarians, those are real centenarians you see there. They look positive. They look brilliant. Don't you think so? I hope you will be like that when you're 100 years. So they have a lot of good psychological actions. The first one is they have a will to live. They want to live because life is fun and life is, is pleasant. And they have the courage to grow old because it's not always easy to have uh, this, this, this courage. 
to grow old. And um, they have acceptance. They accept what happens. They live in the moment of now. They are very expressive. And there's so many things. They're positive. They are happy. They adapt easy, even to the bed of their children and of their spouse. They have a meaning of life. They remain active. They have better um, reactions to stress and they have willpower. They know what they want. You cannot change their mind if they really want something and usually something very positive. They're also very social and they have religious faith. They are believers and they can be believing in nature. It doesn't have to be in a God. And they have spirituality. They are spiritual. And I can tell you, spirituality is something that makes you a better person. And it's so easy to connect. I often don't understand. You just need to, to feel it. Just to stop blocking your perceptions. You have to do an effort not to feel spirituality. And that helps you to live longer. And then feeling of freedom. And feeling of, of youth. And, and so they feel younger inside. Imagine they're more than 100 years old, but they feel like 30 year olds. And then you have the centenarian spirit that is full of humor. So let's look at acceptance. Here are a study done in Tokyo, Japan on 95 years old uh, um, individuals or older. And among these oldest old people, they usually accept themselves and their lives as they are. They even accept that they will die. That doesn't make them unhappy. This is natural acceptance is one of the three predominant things they have. You accept, it's so easy to live when you accept what happens. You cannot do anything anyway well, to what happens. So why would you protest? Don't lose your time in protesting. And they also live in the present time. They don't run in the future like most people, like I did so many years. So the oldest old that are 95 years or older live on a moment to moment basis. They enjoy the moment of now. That's really a thing that I try to learn patients to do because it helps them so much. The even simple events are good events. What happens to you is the best that can happen to you. They also like to make them small decisions for what things happen, okay? And, and so that's one also of the predominant themes they have, my day-to-day -day life with all those precious moments in my life. And then there's the positive effect. They have a positive emotions and mind. Active centurions, they really are positive people. You like to be in their presence because they shine positivity. They usually say, they actually see the sunny side of life. They, they're just happy to be alive. And the philosophy is that by looking at things on positively, that makes your life more enjoyable. You see the positive in other people, so you have a good or better relationship with them. And that makes also your life worthwhile and precious at almost any cost. They can lose a, a leg, but they will continue on being positive. You really have people who have understood something, how to live. And those are centenarians. Optimism here, in a study here, showed that optimism in a big cohort of a lot of uh, women, that if you're in the 25% highest um, levels of optimism compared to the lowest levels, 50% more survival, more chances to five to age 85, and 70% and more in men to survive to age 85. So it's those depend. The more optimistic you are, the longer you will live. So be an optimistic. It's so boring and depressing to be a pessimistic. So just be an optimist. It fits better to your personality. And then remain active. Keep on. If you don't remain active with aging, you rest. So keep on being active intellectually and physically. So you have centenarians. Many continuous activity for several hours. Um, the average of 40% of the centenarians 
agree work four hours a day by volunteer work or hobby. And so what is not used, rest is their motto. And they really have intense physical activity. They are often more active than people 90 or 85 year olds. Then I have a session on the hormone level centenarians. And what you see is that they relatively have higher levels. More, um, they maintain their melatonin activity. They have a higher thyroid activity, higher free T3. They maintain their cortisol activity. It doesn't go down with aging in them. And they have higher maintained DHA activity compared to other uh, younger 80 year olds, for example. And they also have a higher growth hormone and IGF-1 activity often than, uh, especially for men, uh, than at age um, 80 and 80 year olds, probably more oxytocin, uh, more maintained or higher testosterone activity, especially women, they maintain higher testosterone and higher estrogen and progesterone activities in women who become centenarians. So they have better levels. So let's look at one or two of these studies you see that uh, they're fully alive and intelligent well, is probably thanks to their T3. You have a study here on Danish centenarians and what we see is that they, the thyroid that in 90% of normal people that when you, they die is full of nodules, they only 26% of them at autopsy studies have uh, morphological thyroid alterations. Most of them preserve a good thyroid gland. And, and when we look at centenarians and semi centenarians those are people are between 105 and 110 years of age, they have actually, if they have a lower serum free T3 level, they actually have a worse health and more mortality. The T3 is the most active thyroid hormone. If they have a higher T3 level and uh, compared to the T4, which is uh, just a poor hormone, the T4, the T3 is the active hormone, well, the higher free T3 uh, gives them lower mortality and a better functional status. And um, here's a study on centenarian women. And what is very special to centenarian women is they have a strong willpower. They are obstinate and they have positive emotions of fighting back when the problem comes up. You want to impress them. They know what they want. And look at the testosterone level. This is testosterone level in women aged 70 years in USA. This is testosterone level of women in Okinawa, 70 year olds. And here's the testosterone level of Okinawa women at 100 years old. 130% higher actually than in 70 year olds. So it's the women with high testosterone that remain to be centenarians that live longer. Testosterone is a fantastic hormone for women. What about the female hormones in centenarians? Well, the, here's a, a study in Chinese centenarians, uh, more than thousands of these older women, well, and among those 758 centenarians. And what you see is a centenarian woman compared to 80 to 89 year olds have 63% higher serum estradiol levels. Again, a sex hormone that probably makes this woman live longer because there are many studies showing that estradiol makes women live longer. And then there's so much studies that I'm not going to show everything, but it's really interesting to also look at the micronutrient levels of centenarians. And you see, for example, that vitamin A has been found to be high in healthy centenarians. Vitamin A and vitamin E, which are antioxidant vitamins, that maybe helps them to live longer. In Italian centenarians, in order to be objective, I must show that another study in Sardinian and centenarians, Sardinia is one of those, those regions also where there are more centenarians than in other areas of Italy. And there it, they didn't find the difference of higher vitamin A. What about zinc and selenium in centenarians? Well, here's a study in Chinese centenarians, and those centenarians actually had sufficient fingernail levels of zinc and selenium. So it didn't decrease like in older people, often the zinc and selenium levels decrease. And we saw already that giving selenium with coenzyme Q10 helps to live longer 
and to have more longer telomeres. So that's maybe one of the mechanisms why they live longer. And, and they keep their telomeres from shortening because centenarians have actually, uh, in, in one study, the telomeres uh, length of uh, young adults in, on average. So that's, that's impressive. So it probably may contribute to the longevity of centenarians following the research of those good levels of zinc and selenium. And then there's sessions five, six, seven on life extension with hormone therapies. And um, you have estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, insulin, thyroid, cortisol, DHEA, glutamine, IGF-1, and melatonin that all can lengthen life. And this is one of the reasons also that I promote to correct these deficiencies with aging, not only to make people feel better, but also to live longer and have less age-related disease. Let's look at Grotemol. This is a study on adults that have Grotemol deficiency. As you see, they look obese and sagging. And if they don't receive Grotemol adult, they will still look like that. And they have a more than double dead overall mortality. If they receive Grotemol treatment, and the Grotemol treatment was not given very long, they, it neutralizes the excess mortality. And, and for example, uh, this, it was on average 1.2 years of treatment. So somewhere three to four years, some for six months, but on average, it already make a difference for surviving better. I will also talk about the relationship between hormones and premature aging syndromes like progeria, like um, Werner syndrome. Progeria is premature aging syndrome in children. Werner syndrome is uh, premature aging syndrome in adults. And there are some studies showing the low hormone levels in these syndromes and the efficacy, partial efficacy of providing hormone therapies in some case studies, because there are not much of these premature aging syndrome. There's also AIDS that we'll talk about. There's also patients with um, disease that give a life shortening effect that we'll also talk about the hormone effects that, that, that can be beneficial there. So progeria, when you look at a progeria patient like this, you, he has a small height. He has a lot of signs of growth hormone deficiency. Diffuse hair loss is also can be due to growth hormone deficiency. The nose and the chin are underdeveloped uh, here. That's typical for growth hormone deficiency. There's a, a poor memory also psychologically. They are very easily scared, uh, uh, like you see here also on the picture, and tense. That also could be due to growth hormone deficiency. And indeed, the levels of not growth hormone, but IGF-1, which is um, reflects growth hormone activity. That's a hormone that thickens the skin and that is whose secretion is mostly depending on growth hormone. Well, that is very low in those patients. And studies when you give uh, growth hormone, it increases IGF-1 and they actually grow better and they are better. You see this again, progeria, and you see they have a lot of hyaluronic acid secretion. That is typical for these patients but normal levels of growth month with very low IGF-1 levels and high basal metabolic rates. And so when you give them growth hormone treatment in these several cases of progeria, it improved the linear growth and paradoxically, which is not expected when you give growth hormone, it decreased the basal metabolic rate that is too quick and that consumes their body. What about thyroid therapy? Well, here you have critically ill adults and those who don't survive in critical illness actually have on day one significantly lower T3 levels and a higher reverse T3, which blocks T3 action. T3 is really, it provides a thyroid action. And um, it actually, they 
have until day from day five on a lower serum TSH because everything perishes. So the hormones is there secreted except the reverse day three. And those that survive actually have from day five until the last day have an increase of all these hormones, TSH, T4, T3, which does not happen in those that die. So you probably die because there's no increase of thyroid hormones. And there are many studies showing that a low T3 provides more mortality sometimes impressively more. What about thyroid antibodies? You think it's not dangerous? Well, look at this study. These are patients um, with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and actually it increased by 40% the risk of dying by unknown causes, but mainly by suicide. And it also 70% increased the risk of dying by cardiovascular disease. So it's not healthy to have autoimmune antibodies and you should do something. There are many things you can do. Providing selenium, vitamin D, I explained that in all my lectures, what are the doses to give? Avoid milk products. Provide thyroid hormones is often one of the uh, treatments to decrease the thyroid antibodies. And here's a study about hypothyroidism effect on cardiac patients. When you have a low free T3, that below the tree, one picomol per liter, and the reference range is between two and seven or so, you're still within the reference range below normal. When you're below that, after one year, there's about in heart patients, there's almost four times less chances of surviving. So really, that's the difference. You don't have to provide too much thyroid hormone, but, but a sufficient amount at least to, to be at a higher level of T3. So the low free T3 was by far the best predictor of all cause death in these patients, better than cholesterol and, and the high age or the low ventricular fraction. What about melatonin therapy in cancer patients with metastatic cancer? After one year for brain gliomas with metastasis, compared to radiotherapy alone, against glioma with melatonin, seven times more survival after one year. Imagine when you have a glioma patient, please provide melatonin. Doses are between 10 and 20 milligrams a day. It's not dangerous to give a high amount. Solid tumors, interleukine two only as a treatment, not much survival, but three times more when you add melatonin to the treatment. And then this so dangerous non-small cell lung, lung cancer. If you give chemotherapy alone, maybe 25% more survival, but much better when you give melatonin to the chemo, added to the chemotherapy. So it's all really interesting. Solid tumors, supportive care alone, are interleukin 2 and melatonin, four times more survival. Colon tumors, supportive care alone, and then interleukin 2 and melatonin, three times more survival. So always provide 10 to 20 milligrams of melatonin in a cancer patient, certainly if there are metastasis. And you can provide up to 100, 200 milligrams safely. I explained that in other lectures where I talk about what to do with melatonin in cancer. There's a whole model on melatonin. DHA therapy, Life extending at physiological dose. DHA is this main hormone we make that, that has the highest production in our body at age 25. And you see the older men who died after two years had 61% lower serum DHA levels over 65 years. I'm age 65, so I'm taking DHA. So that's okay. I probably neutralize this higher risk I have of dying at age 65. And if you, they die after four years, so they hold longer, actually they have a better level of DHA sulfate, but still too low compared to the men who stay uh, alive. So if you're age 65 or older, take DHA. That's the minimum you can do, 20 to 50 milligrams, depending on your gender. What about cortisol therapy? It's life extending at physiological dose. Don't give too much. But if in emergency situation, you can give much more because that helps. So it's essential to stay alive. And if you have a total disappearance of cortisol, you're dead within 24 hours. 
due to an adolescence crisis, severe hypoglycemia and arterial tension. Your blood pressure drops and your sugar level drops catastrophically. And you die from that. So you cannot live without cortisol. And here, for example, uh, patients who had acute myocardial infarction and who died within 30 days, they had 40% lower serum cortisol levels. And those who had in the 25% lowest levels of cortisol, that's a very low level, had nine times more mortality within 30 days. So why not provide a little cortisol with DHA, with DHA as a protector? What about stroke survival? There you don't need to have too much or too low cortisol. So patients with acute ischemic stroke, those who have too low or too high levels have an increased one year mortality. So you shouldn't be below the 93 nanograms per liter or above the 200 nanograms per liter, which are still within the reference range because this is the reference range. What about estrogens, female hormones? They also are life extending at physiological doses. And um, so here are women who have had undergone hysterectomy. If the one where you take out the uterus and they are 50 to 59 years old, or say they're postmenopausal, and they don't receive female hormones, after 10 years of follow up, you actually have an increased risk of premature death. In a sample of 21 million women, they, they lose 32 excess deaths after 10 years, 32,519. That could have been avoided by providing estrogen therapy. It's mostly due to coronary heart disease mortality that they disappear, these excess women. And estrogen therapy really improves that. And what about trauma survival? When you have a trauma, can you give progesterone, for example? Yes, you can. Half of the study where progesterone was given show beneficial effects on tra brain trauma patients or traumatic patients. And for example, after the mortality uh, with placebo is, for example, if it is one, you have a, a more than 50% decrease in mortality when intravenous progesterone is given. It's more or less two times 100 milligrams to two times 350 milligrams per day for a 70 kilo person. So for head injury patients here. And it's mostly those who have moderate traumatic brain injury that survive better with progesterone, those who were so catastrophic that no treatment can help. And what about testosterone treatment, giving male hormone to men? Here you have the cardiovascular survival. And uh, what it does on testosterone treatment is that in these, this sample of more than 800 men that had low initial total testosterone, quite low level, below the lower le limit of young uh, men. And this is a prospective study. So after three years of follow-up, when they received testosterone therapy compared to men who were low in testosterone but did not receive a treatment, there was 26% less major adverse cardiovascular events, 27% less risk of myocardial infarction, and 35% less mortality. So they made a difference for the heart. And the, the heart is a pump for, full of muscles. So it responds very well on testosterone. If you ever have a heart attack, I can tell you I'll take much more testosterone. And I explain these type of treatments in emergency situations to provide to people with myocardial infarction or stroke or, um, or intestinal necrosis. What about COVID-19 survival and testosterone deficiency? You see here the low serum total testosterone. This is a study in 31 men. And what you see here is that if they have a low testosterone that is about 50% lower than lower limit of young men, that's quite low level, 
but many old men have that sort of level. Well, if they have that very low level of testosterone here, the transport intensive care unit, if they have the COVID-19 is very much increased and up to, if it's below five nanomoles here, 23% more risk of having go to intensive care, meaning that you have very severe form of COVID-19. While if it's above the fine nanomole, there's almost no risk of having to go to the intensive care. And mortality is even more increased. If you're um, below the five nanomole level, you have an enormous amount more uh, chances of getting in intense, uh, more dead from the COVID-19. There's almost no mortality if you're above the five nanomoles. So don't be too low in um, the total testosterone. And then uh, what about women? And we're going to, I think, end with that. This is the coronary artery here. These are coronary arteries. And they can be actually stenotic. You see here the atherosclerosis. And does testosterone have some interference in women about that? Yes. You see that if there's lower serum total testosterone levels and also even low DHA levels in women, they have more risk of dying from ischemic heart disease, significantly lower, especially diabetic women have that. So in conclusion, how much longer can we live with hormone therapies or with interventions? And here I'm going doing speculation. I'm, I'm giving personal um, uh, premonitions or, or, or data that is maybe not 100% scientific, but based on all those scientific studies I saw. The greatest improvement uh, for survival, for longevity, is by improving your emotions, your psychology, and by being more spiritual. You can probably have an additional seven years longer life. You will take also better care of yourself if you have good psychology. If you breathe better um, and you have more physical activity, you also can probably have an additional four years of, of life. And a healthy diet, maybe also four years of, of life with healthy foods and drinks. And nutritional supplementation, maybe also four years longer. So that gives an additional 16 years. So if you would normally die 78 years, you probably get to be 94 years if every aspect there is well done. If you do hormone supplementation, like Grotemont, you probably get an additional four years of life more. And, and if you take female hormones in women and, and women take uh, testosterone, they probably get each time an additional two years. So maybe four years by taking those sex hormones. If men take testosterone, it's maybe an additional four years more. Thyroid, maybe two years more long. Cortisol at the right dose, maybe also two years longer. DHA two. Melatonin, two years also. Oxytocin, possibly also. Vasopressin, aldosterone, and pregnenolone each maybe half a year longer. But when you calculate that, you probably might get also an additional 16 years of life. If ever all these hormones are corrected, if they are deficient, or if the patient naturally has an, uh, uh, optimal levels. So 94 years too, if you're 70 years, you only do hormone treatment. But if you join both, and that is what I suggest you to do. Maybe it could, maybe 32 years. So in place of dying at 78 years, maybe 110 years. Maybe I'm too optimistic, but even if it's just a third of that, and it's worth it because the additional years you have are years of quality of life where, where you feel good. So I thank you for your attention and I'm going to answer questions, but first let me introduce you to some of my books. I have a reversing physical aging book. You can click here. That has all the information on what to do to age much less on the face, the hair, the senses, the eyes, the hearing. There are a lot of things you can do that work well. And then there's the Atlas of Endocrology for Hormone Therapy, the Hormone Handbook, Testosterone, that are more uh, in specifics given here, you see that Atlas has a lot of pictures and that really helps you to detect the hormone deficiencies of eight, 20 hormone deficiencies with pictures, more than 650 pictures and the uh, pictures of hormone excess also so that for 19 hormone excess so that you really know and that's absolutely important if you want to be an expert 
in hormone therapy, you need to know how the patient is before and how it will change with treatment. Hormone Handbook, that's, I would say, the basic book. If you need to know how to do hormone therapy, you have all the information. It's with a yellow background is the most important information for the test, for the treatments, that you see all the different um, information, very easy to read that are explained also how to solve problems during treatment. So if there's one book you need to buy as a physician, this is the book. Testosterone therapy gives all the information you need on testosterone. Really helpful even how to treat prostate cancer patient with testosterone and other treatments, how to reverse prostate hypertrophy, how to calm down too much female hormones in men, how to improve erectile dysfunction. Everything is it. You have all the information that is written here in a lot of information, always practical and with strong references. And then you have also here um, the e-learning and a special offer. I have a postgraduate program for a really trained program that is really worthful where you learn the hormone therapy uh, in, in a very interesting way, very strong way, very well referenced. And you have in the first year, for example, uh, COVID-19 affects his immunity, inflammation, inflammation disorders, also with nutritional therapies, reversing physical aging. That's the most sold course, a very, very interesting course. Female hormone supplementation, chronic fatigue and burnout. I think this session, every physician should have it. There's all the information with nutrients and with hormone treatments and diet that is there. And then you have thyroid a diagnosis and treatment, melatonin, testosterone in men, testosterone in women, very well explained. So you can really be. And we have the first seven modules in Spanish translated, and we're going to have all the modules in Spanish. And then you have the hormone therapy consultation, that's cycle two. Uh, this, if you have one course to take, that is this one, because that gives you to start ideal course. Really interesting. We have a lot of patient cases also that I explain to you. You have practical information, very practical. Adrenal hormones, DHA, cortisol, pregnolone, grotamon and IGF-1. That will um, interest you. Psychological disorders. I think uh, any psychiatrist, but also any general practitioner should know this information, how hormone therapies improve anxiety, depression, autism, stress, schizophrenia, and so on. And then there's the longevity, which I'm just finished now. So you will, have, in the next two days, everything is on the, the website with a lot of courses. It has a lot of courses. It has actually seven courses, not three courses. And then there will still be other um, coming on sexuality, obesity, cardio. So you, that's cycle two. You can join these cycles. And don't forget that you can also have each session separately. So if you're just interested in one, you can buy them like longevity. And I think this is a dual longevity because you really have information that you need as a physician, but even as a, a lay person, as a nutritionist, it's really interesting what you have here. Not you know, this is the reversing model that you can buy separately with all different information. A lot of pictures, each session that you have is two hours in general, but you have the PowerPoint slides, you have the references, very, very strong. And we have also hormone therapy training in Russian, internet from Ukraine. This is in the Global Age Management Academy, who also um, has uh, given here, provided uh, very um, good translation, Ukrainian, but they have a Russian translation of it. So even Russian physicians uh, can uh, join this and learn a lot. And there's the hormone therapy consultation that has been finished. And there are other ones that are in, in the making that will be finished soon. And, and so you have this information for those um, who need the information in Russian, who are Ukrainians, Russian, etc. We're not going to have any political intervention. We support the peace and we support the Ukrainian people and their suffering. But we have we like the Russian people also. It's not politicians are different from those who live in Russia. Uh, so, and what about my next events? If you want to uh, go live, I have um, a longevity workshop on Thursday, December 8th on the main conference in the world on anti-aging medicine, A4M, uh, American Academy of Anti-Aging in Las Vegas. 
and they have a very important uh, conference this year on longevity. And I'm talking about uh, giving a workshop on improving lifestyle and diet and just living longer with all the longevity factors. I'm talking two hours on centenarians with some of the best information you would like. And then I have four hours on the hormone therapies uh, with also how they work on premature aging syndromes and, and disease, but mostly focused on their uh, capacity to make you survive longer and even live a healthy life longer. So you have all these hormones like melatonin, growth hormone, IGF-1, DHA, thyroid, et cetera. And I will give also um, the same day in the evening, a treating adult hormone deficiency free session uh, um, that you will get a lot of interesting information, um, but very for really for the beginner, very interesting, but it also permits a contact with you. I like to have contact and to answer questions. So if you have questions, you can ask them at the workshop or at this evening session. And then on the main session, I will talk, is cortisol the number one longevity hormone? And I can tell you, uh, you will probably open your eyes and uh, many of you will want to get yourself on cortisol treatment because there are many good effects if you do it safely. So I'll talk how to do it safely and, and efficiently uh, without that. I, I take myself cortisol and I can tell you, I um, am very grateful for this treatment. We thank all the partners we have, like uh, the Saham, Longevity uh, Salude, Townsend Leather, PharmaNor, 4000 APK, Access Labs, Qualivita, etc., who are helping us throughout. So I really special thank these you all, physicians and healthcare professionals and organizations, to share this free event with the network. If you want to have contact with us and share uh, webinars in the future please feel free to do so. We like working in cooperation with you. And if you need contacts, you have more information on our website, hertalkmedicalschool.eu. And this is our email, office at hertalk.eu. So I'm going to answer some of the questions now. And um, I must tell that the Ukrainian will probably leave in a quarter of uh, uh, 50 minutes because they have. Um, uh, they have a martial law and at, uh, they were, it's more than 10 o'clock uh, in their place and at 11 o'clock they have to be at home because of the war. So uh, these are all the links, Facebook, uh, in LinkedIn and, and artists, YouTube, uh, etc., where you can get the information. So let me go into the questions. I really thank you for your attention and um, I also thank a lot the translators who really have done their best. Uh, without you, it's not possible to get a lot of people. Uh, and uh, also, I just for the people, um, I'm also in Brazil next week, actually, giving also workshop on longevity for hours. So if you're in Latin America, is the Longevitat Salude uh, conference. Uh, which is uh, the best, biggest anti-aging conference in um, the Brazil. So please um, be free and it's an excellent occasion also to meet each other. And uh, you will see that uh, I will come with some good information, but there are a lot of very good speakers there also uh, that are internationally well known. So let me take the question and answer session. And um, there will be a, for those who um, they can, this recording can be reviewed later on. It will be accessible on Facebook and other um, ways uh, you, you can get access to it. There's a question in Ukraine, I cannot read it. So um, sorry for, um, don't uh, read a Russian or Ukrainian. Is weightlifting for 45 minutes a vigorous activity? I think weightlifting 45 minutes is maybe too intense um, uh, for longevity. It, it still will make you live longer, but not as long as some um, more moderate exercise. Running at nine kilometers an hour in a treadmill vigorous activity, I think uh, running at nine kilometers an hour for some people is, is a moderate activity, so a good activity to live longer. Uh, you have to feel it yourself. You have to feel um, if you are um, out of breath, it's not good. You have to be in the steady state when you do an exercise. If you're in a steady state, 
then you're in a moderate exercise. It has still to be sufficient that you feel it, uh, but don't be uh, out of bread. Uh, don't forget that breathing helps you also to live longer. So people, for example, who are snoring at night, they have two to four times more mortality. So if you're a snore, find a solution, not necessarily an operation, but one of the uh, ways is to put your chin near your sternum. It's almost impossible to snore then. So if you're on your sides, in fetus position when you, you, you um, sleep, you probably breathe better and you will live some years longer. What is the right way to lower the SHBG? So the sex hormone binding levels, it's a protein that transports sex hormones and mainly the male hormones. If it's too high, it keeps the male hormones in blood. And one of the best ways to lower the SHBG is to provide testosterone. So when you correct the testosterone the fish, you lower the SHBG levels. Another way uh, is not um, a real way. You just drink more water and you dilute more your SHBG in a bigger volume. So uh, some people have a high SHBG just because they don't have enough water in their body. They don't drink enough water. So drink enough water and take enough testosterone. And can the micronized progesterone capsules be used as suppository using lubricant for the case of not getting the suppositories? Uh, I haven't used um, the progesterone as uh, suppositories that are given, they are given vaginally to women, but I suppose that if you put them sub in, as suppositories and they stay in the um, inside, you will have an absorption of the myconized progesterone capsules because it's uh, absorbable uh, vaginally. So it should be absorbable also um, suppositories. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, what is the right values of dehydrotestosterone in men? Uh, an average man should have a dehydrotestosterone around the 750 picograms per ml. Uh, but usually it's not the dehydrotestosterone. So the reference range is between 300 and 1,000 uh, picograms per ml of dehydrotestosterone. That's the super male hormone. And, um, but it's better to use as a test the metabolite of dehydrotestosterone, androstandel glucuronide. And that uh, uh, in men, uh, the average value should be 15 to 70 nanograms per milliliter. That's 15 to 70,000 picograms per ml. Or in women, three nanograms or two nanograms per milliliter. Um, and then here's a whole series of testing that are given, but I won't be able to go in details. Uh, there's a, a low estradiol, the progesterone is normal, IGF-1 looks uh, too low because the igf is too high, and testosterone, okay, and so it's a man because there's a high level of testosterone, but it's too low for men, and dehydrotestosterone is also a little bit low, and the sex hormone binding globin is too high, and the PSA total is uh, too high. And prostate is 80 grams. So that's probably due because at a certain time, this man had uh, taken, uh, had too high estradiol levels because he drank caffeinated coffee or um, alcohol or has obesity. So there are three factors that increase the prostate because they increased the estradiol. How is it possible to lower the benign prostate hypertrophy is by putting progesterone suppositories. Uh, in um, the um, uh, rectum and um, in, in giving uh, a dose that is about 150 milligrams minimum for such uh, an important uh, prostate hypertrophy. And then there must be some testosterone given and probably aromatics, which blocks excessive conversion of testosterone to estradiol. Um, good. What do you think about soya drink? Um, I heavily um, propose you not to take soy drink because soy drink in men and in women, uh, in women is maybe better, but in, in uh, men, it uh, blocks the, uh, the phytoestrogens of the soya drink, block testosterone receptors and decrease testosterone production. So the, the problem is that you get erectile dysfunction the day you drink uh, a liter of soy drink, for example. So I'm not, uh, you can take soy drinks maybe twice a month, but don't take it every day. Um, 
of coenzyme Q10, what is the mechanism to diminish the cardiovascular mortality? I don't really know the mechanism of coenzyme Q10. Uh, coenzyme levels in the heart of coenzyme Q10 are very high. So the heart accumulates coenzyme Q10 and it does increase um, the contractions of the heart and it protects the heart from free radicals so that there's no damage by free radicals in the heart when there's a lot of coenzyme Q10. So that is probably the mechanism that decreased the mortality, decreasing the free radicals and making the heart pump better so that there's blood all over the body uh, more. What is the right IGF-1 to IGF-PP ratio? Um, it's, it's difficult to tell because the reference range and the units of labs are much different. But basically, if it's expressed in micrograms per liter, IGF-1 and IGF-PP3, the good ratio is uh, something like one IGF-1 uh, um, microgram per liter to 10 microgram per liter IGF-PP3. So some content on internet suggests that colostrum works in increasing growth mode. If that is valid, does it also work as an alternative to microdoses of mecasermin? Um, I think colostrum probably contains IGF-1 and not growth hormone stimulators. And that is probably why colostrum works partly. Uh, but it's very difficult to absorb IGF-1. And it, it does, there are growth factors anyway um, that, that may help. So I, I think the best treatment is still to give micro doses of injectable IGF-1. Um, but I must admit that in young uh, boys and young girls who cannot grow, I uh, exceptionally um, propose them to take milk products and yogurt, for example, because it's rich in IGF-1 and other growth factors and they grow better with it. So that's the exception I do because usually I don't like uh, milk products in, in patients. What about the uh, selenium and zinc? In some persons, uh, in some persons can it, it grow some tumors that would be careful to give away. I don't know. Um, I don't know studies really that show that high selenium levels and zinc would uh, make some tumors grow, um, maybe in vitro in laboratory cultures, but certainly not uh, to my knowledge uh, or to my experience, it's, it's extremely safe to give sel selenium and zinc. The only problem you can give with zinc is that it may give heart arrhythmia if the dose is too high, but selenium is very safe for the heart. So if you give 200, 400 or 600 milligrams per day, it doesn't seem to be uh, harmful. In uh, China, um, some in some areas, there's so much selenium that people eat six, uh, 700 micrograms uh, per liter per, per, per day uh, without any problem. How can I buy the Atlas on the heartdogmedicalschool.eu? You can buy the Atlas uh, to internet thus, and you will get a quick delivery. Many thanks, great presentation. Do you recommend to give testosterone to men with high PSA? Yes, I do recommend to give testosterone to men with high PSA. The testosterone will not increase the PSA, the prostate-specific antigen. Uh, if you don't have too much estrogen, too much female hormone. So I do, I'm very careful to check estrogen levels that they don't increase excessively with testosterone. Otherwise I provide uh, arimidex and I do recommend to all men who take testosterone to absolutely stop the caffeine. It's better to take safely testosterone than drink coffee and that, that puts so much problems. So the caffeinated coffee is a problem and the alcohol is a problem that increases estradiol, but it's not, not, not good for the PSA. Uh, an estrogen to women with history of breast cancer surgery. Certainly, um, women who um, take female hormones, estrogens and progesterone, don't forget that, after breast cancer have 50% less recurrence. Um, a meta-analysis of 15 studies of women taking female hormones after breast cancer showed an average of 50% less breast recurrence. And the mortality also increases even more. Mortality uh, decreases between 20 and 80% 
in women who after breast cancer take female hormones. And this is also valid for estrogen positive, receptor positive and progesterone receptor positive tumors, which are usually less dangerous anyway. So really very, very important uh, to give female hormones, but never in estrogen dominance. That means that the woman may never have painful breasts. So you give low estrogens and more progesterone. Um, I'm talking in this model longevity, I'm, I'm also talking how you can make women with breast cancer live longer thanks to female hormones and what the doses are. So you found the information in this uh, longevity model that you can buy separately as all the models of you can buy separately. Are there any natural alternative for external testosterone application in the form of shells, some specific foods? Um, there are um, some foods like the plant extracts, tubulus terrestris, that increases 20% of free testosterone that maybe give some help to improve testosterone. Now you must know also that the effect of testosterone will increase by eating proteins, but not excessive proteins. And that basically you can increase your testosterone levels, any person, uh, by eating more fats, like butter, uh, egg yolk, uh, liver, you will have higher testosterone levels. And you should absolutely avoid for testosterone levels, whole grain bread. Whole grain bread makes women and men lose testosterone in the stools up to three times more. So don't do that. Uh, so um, what is the maximum daily amount of hydrocortisone intake per day for men and women? Well, average the average intake of hydrocortisone to take in men and women. In women is 20 milligrams a day for an average size Caucasian woman and 30 milligrams for a man with the similar amount of DHA, 20 milligram DHA for women, 30 milligrams for, for men. Uh, you can take go in men up to 35, 45 milligrams a day, and for women uh, up to 25, 30 milligrams a day. So a little less in women. Yeah, so there's a question about atrial natriuretic peptides in heart hormones. I don't have any experience with atrial natriuretic peptide heart hormones. So I cannot comment on that. Um, Usually when natural detective peptides increase, there's a heart problem, Is there? A, but it's made in the heart. Is there some study available that establishes relationship between neurokinetic patterns and movements and the functioning of hormone-generating glands? I'm not sure I understand the question. I think uh, it's, there may be a question of hyperkinetism, of being excessively nervous and moving, and that is typical for low thyroid function when you're your blood flow is slow in the, in, in the brain, you are actually um, low thyroid in general, and, and then you need to shake up and, and move. So uh, people calm down, hypothyroid people calm down, are less hypokinetic when they get thyroid therapy. Um, and it's a question in French, but I'll... Um, Say it in English. How can you prevent the destruction of the thyroid by Hashimoto? Well, actually, I did talk about it in this lecture. Uh, there's selenium. You provide selenium at a dose between 200 and 400 micrograms a day. You um, provide vitamin D at about 10,000 international units a day. Say that's safe, no problem. And then you correct thyroid deficiency and you take out milk products. That's the basic treatment. But there are other uh, things. I have a whole lecture on what to do in Hashimoto thyroiditis in, one, in the model on thyroid therapy, which is very interesting, where you can get additional information. But basically, each intervention can decrease the thyroid antibodies by 20%. So if you add all these, you can get a 60, 80% or even total disappearance of autoimmune disease. But don't forget that the food is very important. And I believe also psychologically that you should um, um, be in much better resist to stress more calmly. Are my uh, um, courses uh, disposable in French? There are some of the lectures that are on, on, on a website freely available. 
in a more uh, shortened form in the LIMS uh, website. Uh, that's a laboratory for laboratory analysis. Uh, it's L-I-M-S, LIMS in French. And there you have some of the courses, but otherwise most of the courses are for the moment all in English and are in, in Spanish or in Ukrainian. How often do you check lab tests? On the average, it's every six months. Thank you for the great presentation. Yes, and I would like to ask how to help patients with degenerative brain disease like a Park, uh, Parkinson. I have also lectures on what to do for Parkinson, Alzheimer's, etc. You can do a lot for Parkinson. Uh, for the trembling, it's more difficult. You can stop further trembling, but reverse the trembling is more difficult to my experience. But um, you can completely reverse the dementia that they start having. And then they can have uh, do sports again, stand up straighter. But you absolutely need to add growth and uh, to the treatment of Parkinson. If a person has multiple sclerosis, it's not Grotamon, it's IGF-1. Because Grotamon decreases cortisol and gives a crisis of MS, but, uh, um, multiple sclerosis uh, responds better to IGF-1 and thyroid therapy. Those are the two main ones. Can you bring a discount to buy the Atlas and the hormone amplitude if you personally purchased the first editor? I certainly think there's a discount. Just contact the service, I gave the numbers. Okay. Thank you, Dina Kader, for your compliments. Fantastic presentation. And thanks a lot. Okay, that's all thanking. What is the best way, that's in French, but what is the best way to avoid kidney stones? There are the best way, there are three ways, actually. You need to take the anabolic hormones. So you don't lose excessive calcium in the uh, kidneys. So that's sex hormones, grotamon, testosterone, etc. And then you need also to take magnesium that dissolves the calcium oxalate um, tablets, magnesium and vitamin B6. And you need also to drink enough water. And that's the best way to avoid new um, kidney stones. In my experience, there's a lot more to do, but basically that helps also avoid acid drinks, absolutely, because they take out the calcium of your bones, like coffee, tea even, uh, black tea uh, and, and alcohol that uh, makes you lose uh, calcium in the urines that you should avoid. Thank you from Arizona. Okay, uh, okay, okay. I think we're almost going to. Then there's a question here in Spanish. What is the recommendation for therapy with cortisol in patients with osteoporosis? When you have osteoporosis, you need to go on the anabolic hormones and you need to take vitamin D and calcium and uh, avoid acid drinks. So if you do all that, you avoid coffee, you, you eat uh, enough proteins, but not too much because that arises at its fight and you avoid milk products, very important. You're on a good diet. And uh, you should then take the anabolic hormones that reverse osteoporosis like testosterone, estrogens, progesterone, creatimol. They really make a big difference, those hormones. And then you can take cortisol safely with a sufficient dose of DHA. So if you give 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone, you give 20 milligrams of DHA and the other anabolic hormones. And then, then it's, it's okay. So, um, and then maybe, uh, yeah, the protocol for supplementing estrogen and progesterone in menopausal women is usually providing them from the first day of the month to the 25th day of the month, estrogen and uh, progesterone together. So they don't get menstruation this way. And you provide them, for example, two milligrams of transdermal estradiol in the morning and in the evening from the first to 25th day of the month, 100 milligrams of microdose progesterone. And that is the average treatment that menopausal women get and they feel good. And they stop five days at the end of the month to avoid having breast cancer. And then the last question is, can consumption of bile salts for gallbladder stone issues increase the risk of pancreatic or stomach inflammation? 
um, to my experience, and I have not a big experience uh, in bile salt intake, but there, it does exist. I don't know about having it inflaming the pancreas on the stomach. I didn't encounter that, but again, I haven't uh, given this often to patients. I haven't had patients often with the treatment. It is a very good treatment for those who have had the gallbladder removal, uh, but for the rest, I cannot really comment. So I, I think we're finished. I want again to thank all the Spanish, the, the, the translator, the Spanish translator, the French translator, and, and the Ukrainian translator, um, and for your good input. You've, you've been like this, so I must post this. You're really good. And um, I hope you enjoyed. And don't forget that you can review again this webinar uh, on uh, one of our uh, websites. So see you soon. Bye-bye. And thank you for being there.